So we're gonna go have a little rest All right. to start everything out. And it's oh. nighttime, so I'd really rather not be out. All right. And I realized that I did a silly thing in memorizing so much magic missile. Okay, now we should be ready to go. Now, we're going to offload a bunch of junk at the store. I'm gone. And then uh, do the southeast. Oh dear. We went to the wrong. Okay, yeah, we went to the wrong place. Don't want to be there. <laughs> this is more like it. So we're just going to go to the market, we'll sell our stuff, and then we're going to do that other little segment of the hive. Now there's a little trick to this that mages have a special ability for. All right. Done. So I'll show you. This spell, Friends, makes my charisma much higher, which as a result causes me to get better prices from merchants, which gives me more gold. Now this ring that we got back in the mortuary allows me to get money out of it and then it's gone forever. Now we're going to cast the friend spell. We're going to cast the friend spell. And you'll see that gives me an extremely high charisma. It gives me legendary charisma. So this guy will take our weapons off of us. Don't really need the dustman robes. Or that knife. Or any of this jewelry. Or the Tome of Blood and Ash any longer. So that'll give us some good money. Get rid of the Fist Irons. And the Jagged Knife. Now we need someone to buy those armor plates. I think he might buy them. There we go. So there's... We're rid of our armor plates. I think that's all the more anyone will buy. Well, we got those copper rings. There we go. So now we should be pretty well loaded. Done. And this is the hive segment we want to go to. Now we already did one quest in this area, and uh, that was solving this fight that takes place over here. All right. But there are a couple more things we can do. I'm gone. So there's this drunk harlot here, and she's mostly just drunk. Uh. And she won't answer any questions or do anything productive. And you say goodbye. Now if you have a high enough wisdom score, you notice that she's pickpocketing you. And if you bait the woman into pickpocketing you, you can observe her and gain a lot of experience. 
Now, you, if you have 13 dexterity, you can grab her hand. And I'll say, stop screaming or I'll remove your lungs. Return what you stole from me. So she gives us also a little bit of extra money, too. And you can snap her neck, or you can let her go. I say, don't let me see you again, and let her leave. And that apparently upset some thugs. They do not like us today. Thankfully, this guy's AI is glitched out, so we only have to fight this one here. He's, he's what we would call a team baiter. Alright, so that's done. Pick up some loot. And we'll tell July that uh, I lied to Craddock for him, and that'll be a nice thing. Uh-oh. More hate. Stupid yabo. Mort's taunt is rather a lot like what became commonplace in MMOs uh, more recently where he it forces the enemy to attack you. So it's sort of like drawing aggro. Now we'll see Amaris, and that's the lady that Nod sent us to find. It's his sister. She's working as a prostitute. And she gives you a bunch of money, and you can promise to return it to Nod or not. And if you don't return the money to Nod, that's considered an evil thing. You can also do a lot of different stuff with it. With the quest in general. And there's this gentleman barking wilder. He's crazy. And he'll let you join the chaos men, which we're not going to do. But if you ask him where your journals are, he, by following what I did, because I'm not reading what he says, because it's all just nonsense. Updated my journal. But he knows where two of your journals are, and he tells you that one is in a tomb beneath the city, and one is in the Hall of Sensates. And he's part of a Zhao sect. Ooh, we leveled up. More spells. And again, that one's useless to us. Done. Done. And... Well, while we're here... This is Fel's Tattoo Parlor, a pretty important area in the game. Fel is a Davis that, for whatever reason, is no longer a Davis, which is why he doesn't float. He's, he's odd. And I have some questions. Who are you? He says that he's Fel. And you can say that you feel like you know him. 
and he seems to know who you are, but he can't say any more than that. I see. Do you know how I died? He says that shadows killed you. Many shadows. And he doesn't seem to know why. Now you can buy tattoos from him and ta you get new tats throughout the game for various things that you do so, and people in your party. So Tattoo of the Skull is a tattoo I get for having Mort in the party and things like that. Now we can bring the price down by casting friends. Which we'll do. And... I want to buy some tattoos that are going to give me some benefits. Not necessarily that. I want the one that gives me more wisdom, please. There we go. And then all you have to do to wear the tattoo is put it on your skin. in one of your skin slots and you can see now we have 20 wisdom instead of 18. And you've got th the nameless one has three tattoo slots. Other characters can wear tattoos as well. But not all of them. Obviously Mort, you know, he can't. But that's all for that. What, uh, seriously? We're just gonna avoid them. And this is the Smoldering Corpse Bar. The reason it's called the Smoldering Corpse is because of the Smoldering Corpse floating over an oven. And, uh, he's just stuck on fire. You see Drusilla here. That's she's the lover of the guy who is there on fire. He was a wizard once who caused a bunch of fires and he as his punishment a portal to the plane of fire, which is a, a realm of existence that's only made out of fire, uh, was opened inside of him, and as such he's eternally burning, more or less, but for some reason he didn't die, and uh, he's just floating there. Uh, there are a lot of different people to talk to in here, and a lot of different things to do. So we're gonna work through them bit by bit. You find Kendrian here, and he's sort of faded out, and he'll tell you why. But he's a planar traveler, and he can help you with Ingress. So, Updated my journal. we'll deal with that. But you can talk to him here, and he travels the planes, and he explains in very long-winded detail how the planes work. And I'm not going to read through all of it, but while we click through, I'll sort of explain what it is that he's saying. So basically, the... The way that this world works, uh, the torment or planescape uh, setting and world, is it's all very metaphysical. So it's believed that there are that there is a dimension sort of in the middle of everything, and that's called the prime material, and that's what Earth would be like. It's a big mixture of all these different ideas and things. And updated my journal. Now, if you ask him about negation, he gives you 
a token that protects you from the negative energy plane. You want to keep that till the very end of the game because it helps you in the final battle. And you, you have the outer planes, which are representative of ideas. So law and chaos, neutrality, uh, and that's sort of, and then you have the inner planes, which are a little bit closer to the prime material, and those are made up of absolute things. So fire, water, air, and earth, the Greek elements, and that's all they are, and things live there. Then the outer planes are like heaven and hell, kind of. And really that's all that uh, Kandarin can help you with. And you have Ebb Creekness here, who's basically a former policeman. And he can tell you a lot of different stuff. And... A pretty interesting story set he has, but he's part of the Harmonium, and he's also participated in the Blood War, and the Blood War is a war between demons and devils, and basically what it is is that devils are very lawful, they want, they're evil, but they want it to follow certain rules. Whereas the the demons don't want it to fall certain rules, so they hate each other more than anything else. And there's a constant war between the abyss, where the demons live, and uh, <coughs> and hell, essentially, where the devils live, the uh, abator. And Ebb Creekness is just a retired guy, and he tells stories and stuff. It, it's I'm not going to read through it, even though it's very interesting, uh, mainly in the interest of time, and and also because uh, it would make the video like hours long. As you can see, there's a lot of text here, and so if you buy the game on your own, you can experience it because it's. It's pretty great for stories. Oh, I keep clicking the same options. And he'll tell you a lot about the lady and Davis's and Mazing. Basically, the Lady of Pain rules over Sigil, and if you upset her, then she puts you in an, a, another dimension that's a big maze. Also, Sigil doesn't have a sun. It just gets bright out and then gets dark. And he'll tell you about keys and portals, which are important, because Sigil is believed to be at the very center of the universe, and it has portals to all locations everywhere. I'm gone. And Elias is uh, a poor guy who's uh, ended up stuck here as he was chasing a bad guy. And he has no idea where he is or what's going on. And you can explain the planes to him for and get 250 XP, which is what we did. And then the most interesting fellow to talk to here is Dakon. The man before you is old. His dry yellow skin has the scars of one who has traveled everywhere and never rested long in any one place. His pinched face is inhumanly angular, and his eyes sweep out from his skull, tapering to points. He wears a loose-fitting orange tunic, and a strange shimmering blade is strapped across his back. The blade looks to be a two-pronged glaive, made of some metal whose surface swirls like a film of oil on a pond. The man turns to you, his eyes like polished coal. He stares through you, and for a moment you wonder if he might be blind. The weapon suddenly turns a dead, flat black, mirroring the man's eyes. Are you alright? He says nothing for a moment, 
searches your face with his eyes. Hail, traveler. His voice is quiet and somber, like a wind whispering through the branches of a great tree. The man meets your gaze, his eyes burrowing into yours. You could say that. The man's gaze does not waver. I am known as Dakon. The emphasis he places on the word known strikes you as odd yet familiar. You're not known to me. I do not know myself. That is for the best. In knowing yourself, there would be little in the plains left worth knowing. I would know why you have come to this city. I'm looking for answers. Speak your questions. I will hear you. Your features are unfamiliar to me. What are you? A Githzerai. What's a Githzerai? A Githzerai is one of the people. One of the people. A Githzerai. Yes, but what are the Githzerai exactly? Dakon is silent for a moment when he speaks. Our history does not need to be made known to you. We would bleed to death on Time's Blade before I recited a fraction of the histories of our people. I don't need to know your histories, but I want to know of your people as they are now. Dakon is silent for a moment. Know this and accept it as an answer. We are the people who make our home upon the shifting plane of Limbo. Limbo is chaos, raw chaos. Uh, it's an outer plane, I'm pretty sure. With a deft motion, Dakon slips the blade from his back and holds it before him. Wait and see what happens. There we mold the matter of Limbo with our minds. We forge cities with our thoughts. As you watch, a series of rippling waves of metal begin to roll forth from the center of the blade. The pitch and crest of the waves match the inflection of Dakon's voice. In its chaos we dwell, with only our knowing to preserve us. We are the Gisarai. What is that blade you have? It moved, shifted in response to your voice. It is a Karach blade. It is an object that lets others know the rank of the wielder. Karach, what does that mean? Dakon falls silent for a moment as if searching for the correct words. In your tongue, the closest translation is chaos matter. The people may shape it with their thoughts. Karach is not shaped by heat, but by knowing oneself. It is a mirror that will reflect the will of the wielder on its surface and in its edge. When one knows themselves, the blade is strong, harder and stronger than steel. When one does not know themselves, the blade is as water, formless and weak. What rank does your blade symbolize? The blade is a symbol carried by the Zerth. A Zerth is one who knows the words of Zerthamon. In knowing the words of the Zerthamon, they know themselves. Zerthamon founded our race. He knew the Gisari before they knew themselves. He defined the people. He gave them one mind. Can you tell me about this city? It is known by the name Sigil. Among the people, it is known as the city does that does not know itself. The city exists, but it does not know itself. In not knowing itself, its existence is flawed. You speak as if this city is alive. It may not be aware and know itself in the sense that you or I might know ourselves, but it lives, it grows, changes, and touches the minds of all that live here. And then you can get in a philosophical debate with him and get some XP. I won't read through it because it's, it's pretty long and esoteric. And you need a high wisdom. But Dakon says, uh, in response to your philosophical point, the words are mine. Once I knew them and knew their meaning, I had forgotten them until you spoke. Dakon's gaze travels through you and his blade stops shimmering, bleeding of all color until it's translucent. There is a moment of silence. Then Dakon looks at you. I would travel your path with you. I accept. An extra blade would be welcome. Strangely enough, his voice seems distant and it echoes. 
as if he were speaking across a very great distance. There's Ilquix here. He doesn't really do anything for you. He'll just answer some questions. And, uh... He doesn't like creatures of law. Now... You, that gives you some lawful points. So that's the only thing worth speaking to him about. And we'll talk to Barkus, the owner of the bar. And he says, you again, eh? What do you want this time? You again? Yeah, you again. You got a hearing problem or something now? You was in here about 15 years ago, got all bubbed up, smashed up the place, and left a pile of coin that wasn't enough to pay for the damages. So you plucked out your own bleeding eyeball and tells me you'll be back to reclaim it when you got 200 coins together. With 15 years of interest, you got 500 coins. You got the jink, pal? I got your eye. I don't have that much. And he'll... you can ask some questions of him. And, uh... That's about it for him right now, but when we get 500 coins, we'll be back. Well, actually, he'll uh, he'll give you a quest, so we'll we'll do that. And there we go. So there's someone over there that uh, isn't paying their bill, and we'll go deal with them in a moment. Now we have O. You see a man standing stock still. He isn't moving a muscle. On closer examination, it appears that he isn't even breathing, just standing. His eye sockets are empty holes in his face. Contained within their bounds is a flat gray light that seems to dance with possibility. Looking into the sockets, the eerie, empty feeling of a limitless void shivers through you, as if you had gazed into a sliver of eternity. The head slowly swivels towards you. You notice that no muscles appear to move under his skin as he turns, and he speaks in a pure, bell-like tone. Well met, Wanderer. You have forgotten again, haven't you? Do you know me, stranger? As he opens his mouth, you get the feeling of eternity again. Inside his mouth, you see no tongue, no teeth. It's almost as if this man were a shell surrounding an in illimitable expanse. I have spoken with you before, and always you forget. Your endless quest to discover yourself ends always in your amnesia. You draw close to the truth and recoil. Let us hope that you have the strength to endure your existence. What do you know of me? How do you know this? I know that you, like a fly, rise up from the wreckage of your old shell, buzz about for a time, and curl up and die at the window of truth. You bumble about the pain, seeking the light without any plan to your actions, and fall exhausted when you fail. You alight on others to feed from them for a time, and move on with no regard to them. I have watched you come here and listened to your words, and watched you move away no wiser. Will you learn from your mistakes? Who are you? I am O. For some reason, when he speaks his name, it sounds like he's speaking of much more than a single letter. As if the speaking of his name contained untold possibilities and nuances. No human tongue could ever create such a sound. What are you? It is my name. It is the name of a portion of eternity. I am a letter in the divine alphabet. Understanding me leads to the understanding of existence. I am written the true names of half of everything. My being encompasses truth. I am mathematic, organic, and metaphysic.
The divine alphabet has written the name of everything that exists, from the seed at the hearts of the elemental planes to the core of the great beyond. My brothers, sisters, a single word translate into the two in your mind. And I reach across all that is, was, or ever shall be. We are thought and reality and concept and the unimaginable. That means you know everything, right? I know parts of many of them. Without a connection to my brothers, sisters, I am but a letter. Alone, I am a symbol. Combined, we are a language and power. So then you don't know the secrets of existence. I did not say that. A letter is still a powerful force, even on its own. Allow me to show you. He opens his mouth wider and wider still. The mask of his face tears around his eyes, mouth, and nose, revealing that hint of eternity you glimpsed earlier. You are lost in it, adrift in it, a part of it. You return to your mundane senses and realize that O has vanished. Yet somehow, your horizons have expanded. Enlightenment has brushed you, however briefly, across the brow. And that gives us plus one to wisdom. Some they don't really do much. They're basically uh, scions of justice. And they're looking out for a guy to kill. And you see these Abishai here. Uh, they're demons. And uh, I'm just going to avoid them, because they're scary. Done. Well, in the improvement pack, I believe they give you a quest, so we'll, we'll mess with them. They, they know you, but you don't remember them. They tell you that it's silly to keep a journal. And Mort keeps warning you against talking. They're fiends. Oh, so they're actually from Baytor. Alright, farewell. We're gonna leave them be. They make me nervous. I believe Mort. And you see Mokai here. The uh, fake dust woman. That owes a lot of money to this place. And, uh, I'll lend you the money. Here, take it and pay up now. And that gives you some good alignment points. Done. You can also poison her drink and kill her. But that's not uh, the nicest thing to do, and we'll not do that yet. And uh, we'll have some fire wine and fire seeds. And for now, that's it here. So we'll go tidy up the quests that we uh, completed. by walking in the wrong direction. <laughs> Done. All right. I'm gone. We're gonna try and find the lady that runs around like crazy. And that might prove to take a while. Oh, there she is. Happy days. Greetings, Ingress. Updated my journal. I'm gone. All right. So now we need to run back to the smoldering corpse. I'm gone. 
to the uh, Planner Traveler, who has sent Ingress home. The Tooth Woman wanted you to have these, he says, holding out his hand. She wanted to express her thanks, even out the balance book, as it were, and be done with this damn thing. In the palm of his hand are Ingress's dancing teeth, and he smoothly deposits them in your hands. Updated my journal. And here are Ingress's teeth, and in the improved version, you... You need to talk to them to get them to work. You examine Ingress's teeth. They can't shake their resemblance to ivory bugs. You can get the feeling that they are looking at you expectantly, awaiting for some command. Hey Mort, come here for a minute. Mort floats over. What's the chant, Chief? You see these teeth? Mort glances at your palm. Ugh! He seems morbidly fascinated. Ugly little burks, aren't they? Do you think you could use them somehow as a weapon, maybe? Bar that, Mort shudders. Would you want those things in you? Come on, Mort, they seem to like you. Look at the way they're staring at you. Those little pikers better not come anywhere near me or all Mort pauses. You know, I have no idea how to threaten teeth. Well, all right, I'm not going to force... Uh-oh. What's wrong? Mort floats in closer and glances at your palm. Hey, they look like they're planning something, don't they? They sure do, don't they? What happens next is difficult to describe and painful to watch. Faster than you can close your palm, the teeth hop out of your hand and swarm into Mort's jaw. Mort howls as Ingress's teeth promptly rip out his old teeth and then jump into the exposed cavities. Mort! Mort continues howling. The teeth settle in, adjusting themselves and planting their roots with a horrid drooling noise. Mort doesn't seem to hear you. He keeps howling and howling, then suddenly starts smashing his teeth together. He gets in three powerful bites before the upper and lower teeth lock together and prevent him from opening his mouth. Wow. Mort mumbles something at you and his eyes widen. Mort, are you okay? The teeth suddenly unlock and Mort takes a deep breath. I will kill you for this. You planned that. I know it. Look, I didn't mean for that to happen. I even warned you. Uh, how do they feel? Mort moves his jaw around experimentally. Odd, but not bad. Suddenly the teeth extend into fangs. Ooh, they change. They shrink down to normal, then fangs again, then normal. I think I'm going to like these. I'm sorry, Mort. I didn't mean you any harm. Oh, I'll still get you for this, Mort replies. He grins, his teeth turning into fangs. Just you wait. Uh, revenge never helped anyone, Mort. Let's go. You turn around to go on your way when you suddenly hear Mort let loose with another howl of pain. Oh no, what happened now? You turn to face Mort again only to see the teeth finish ripping themselves loose from his mouth and leap back towards you. You catch them easily. Mort, still grumbling, groans painfully. I don't know. It seemed like everything was fine for a minute there, but then they ripped themselves out again. The teeth group themselves in your hand in a way so as to somehow face Mort and then clack twice at him fiercely. Hmm, I think they're angry with you, Mort. Oh, I see. Uh, wait, what? They're mad at me? Why? Well, you did insult them, remember? Ugly little burks, little pikers. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Come on, Chief, give them back. Wait, you want them now? Can I assume your vow of revenge against me has been tabled? Mort looks annoyed. Well, it's just that they might be, you know, useful. Mort tries to ignore your grin. All right, yes, I retract my vow of hideous revenge against you. You're one lucky sod, too, might I add. It would have been horrifying. Happy? Can I have them back now? All right, then, here you go. As you move your hand, move to hand them back to Mort, the teeth crawl up your arm until they arrive at your shoulder, chittering and occasionally clacking angrily at Mort. Hmm. I don't think they're going to be happy until they get an apology, Mort. I know I didn't hear you right, boss. I think they did what they did to make a point, Mort. 
But now that it's made, well, you did taunt them. And we know how good you are at that. Sometimes there's a price, you know? Mort sighs. It's time like this. I really miss having eyelids. So I could close them and count to ten. He pauses. All right. Teeth? I'm, uh... I'm... Wait, no, sod that. I can't do it. There's only so much a skull can take. I'm not going to give an apology to a bunch of ugly, yellowed, rotting teeth. The teeth chatter with outrage for a while and then clack sharply twice more at more before settling down. You're not sure how they can tell that they're skulking, sulking, but you're pretty sure that's what they're doing. Well, all right, Mort, if you insist, I'll just put these powerful enchanted shape-changing teeth that, by the way, I suspect are capable of learning and will grow more powerful and magical as you do in this pouch here. You let me know when you change your mind. Mort winces, boss. This may be the most humiliating moment in my entire career as a Mimir. We all have our torments, Mort. Looks like today, this is yours. Mort groans. Gah! Alright, alright, alright. Mort appears to steal himself and says, Teeth? I'm sorry, really. You're no uglier than any other enchanted by cuspids I've ever encountered before. You're as nice a shade of yellow as can really go on teeth. And the rotting crack was totally out of line. I hereby tender my apologies and offer to make amends, alright? Hey, that actually wasn't that bad. Better than I expected. What do you say, teeth? The teeth chitter for a bit, almost as if they're considering it. After a while, they turn to face Mort and clack once, then settle down comfortably in your shoulder. I think they're satisfied, Mort. I think they're leaving it up to me as to when or whether or not to equip you with them. Mort sighs. Fine, fine, whatever. You're the boss. I'll be over here nursing what's left of my ego back to health. Can we go now? Let's. And Dakon doesn't want them. Mort does. And now he has these teeth. And if we click use again, we can ask them to do different kinds of damage. Hey, what's eating you, chief? And, uh, I think that's pretty much as good a time as any to end it. So, Mort's got his teeth, we've picked up Dakon, we paid off some debts, and we found Nod's sister. In the, in the next case, we'll probably solve some more stuff, visit Nod, and then, uh, go to that big building that we didn't go in, in the Northeast Hive, and do a little work for the Dusties.